Hello, everyone, and welcome to another music lesson with Mrs. DiRocco. Today, we're going to look at the French horn and the tuba. Think about what instrument family these two instruments belong. All right, check out the mouthpiece on each of them. On the French horn, it's on the left-hand side. On the tuba, it's on the right-hand side. Now, each of these instruments has a big bell. Look at the French horns. It's on the bottom. And the tuba, the bell, is on the top in, the, in these pictures. Okay, in between the mouthpiece and the bell is all that tubing that's wrapped around, coiled around itself. That's because it takes a lot of tubing. The air has to go through a lot of tubing in order to get the big sounds that these instruments make and those low pitches. Each of them have valves with keys that the player presses on. And when the player presses on these keys in different combinations, it changes how long the tubing is inside. And then that changes the pitch. We've heard all this before. So think really hard what family of instruments these belong to. And we're going to find out for sure if you're right. And switch the slide. Get ready. Here we go. Were you right? Just like the trombone and trumpet, the French horn and the tuba are members of the dun -da -da -dun brass family. And there they are in all their glory, the trumpet, the trombone, the French horn, and the tuba. All right, let's take a closer look at the French horn and the tuba to find out what they have in common with the other brass instruments, as well as what makes them each different. All right, here we go. Let's check out the French horn. I'm Staff Sergeant Becky McLaughlin, and this beautiful brass instrument is a French horn. As a brass player, I also buzz my lips into a mouthpiece, and the French horn uses the smallest mouthpiece in the brass family. Your school may use single horns, which have three rotor valves and one row of tuning slides. The horn I play is called a double horn, like you would see in orchestras and bands. It has three valves, a thumb valve or a trigger, and two sets of tuning slides. This gives me a huge range of pitches. Your right hand goes into the bell of the horn and it normally stays in the same spot. But if you close it up into the bell, you can make the horn sound muted or stopped. <laughs> I love the French horn for its versatility. You've heard it play big, powerful fanfares. Warm, rich melodies like this one from Jurassic Park. and other great melodies like this one. Mm -hmm. 
And that is the French horn. Wow. That was interesting. She said that the mouthpiece on the French horn is the smallest of all the brass instruments. And did you see what she did with her hand, her other hand? She stuck it inside the bell. That looks like fun. Well, Sarah Willis plays the French horn. She was actually the first woman to join the brass section in the famous German orchestra, the Berlin Philharmonic. In addition to playing classical music, Sarah also enjoys exploring different musical styles from all around the world. Here is an excerpt from one of her TV shows that was filmed in Havana, Cuba. Now, this is really cool because, you know, we think of the French horn in the orchestra. Well, check this out. That was something German, and now we have something from Cuba. Sorry, I was so wrapped up in that. Were you dancing? Oh my goodness, how fun was that? Oh wait, here comes the tuba. I'm Steve Campbell, and I'm the principal tuba of the Minnesota Orchestra. I've been playing with the orchestra for 12 seasons now, and I've been playing the tuba since uh, about the age of nine. Um, and. Uh, I initially got interested because my dad is a tuba player and a band director. Okay, now the tuba, making a sound on the tuba starts with the mouthpiece. And a lot of people, you get, you get the question of how do you make sound on a brass instrument? All brass instruments have a mouthpiece. How do you make sound on a brass instrument? A lot of people say, well, you just blow. And if I do that, what happens? <laughs> Nothing. And then somebody say, well, you got to push the buttons or the valves. These are called valves. Okay, let's try that. Blow and push the valves. There's something missing. So what we do is we buzz our lips like this. And then you buzz it into the mouthpiece. And then the, the tuba or any brass instrument works as an amplifier and it, makes, makes, it projects the sound. So the tuba is like any other brass instrument. We're all, we all, we're all doing the same thing, buzzing our lips into the mouthpiece through the tubes. The tuba, a lot of times, is, is considered an umpa instrument. You'll hear the tuba do a lot of this kind of stuff. And that's all fun. And I know I'm supposed to be a tuba player because I like doing that. I like being the, you know, it's a tuba player's job a lot of times to keep the rhythm, be a part of the rhythm section of 80 or 90 people on stage. 
Um, but we do get to play the tune sometimes. <clears throat> Here's one that I particularly like. It's from Prokofiev's Fifth Symphony. Thanks so much for listening about the tuba today, and I hope you remain curious about all the other instruments in the orchestra, and I hope to see you sometime in Orchestra Hall. <laughs> oh, that tuba, what a character. The tuba plays the lowest tones of all the brass instruments. It's a really big instrument. All right. I practiced, so let's see how well I do saying this gentleman's name. Here I go. Oystin Brodsvik. <laughs> Did you like that? Try it. Oystin Brodsvik. Okay, one more time. Oystin Brodsvik travels the world as a full-time tuba soloist and gives master classes at all major universities. Okay, that's pretty cool because tuba players usually join some kind of orchestra. Well, he travels all over as a soloist. Remember what that means. So he is featured with the tuba. Master classes, we heard that before with Sarah Willis, and I forgot to tell you what those are. So they go around to universities and they teach students. Students are chosen to perform for them, and then they perform for these virtuosos, these expert musicians, and then they help them out. They show them really cool techniques. They show them how to fix maybe little mistakes that they're making or, you know, how to play better. So that's what he does. We're going to listen to him play a traditional Hungarian folk dance it was actually written by an Italian composer. It's called Chardes. I had to practice that too. Chardes with a brass band. It looks like he has lots of fun playing the tuba. <laughs> Thank you. 
That was something, wasn't it? Did you hear how fast he was playing those notes? And do you know why he likes to be a soloist? Can you tell how much he enjoys playing to the audience? You can't do that if you're sitting in an orchestra. All right, check this out. This is a sousaphone. It's actually a tuba that fits around the player's body. So the tubing is just shaped differently. This makes it easier to carry in a marching band. It's named after the very famous band leader, John Philip Sousa. He was nicknamed the American March King because he wrote many patriotic pieces for marching bands. Let's watch a short interview with a high school student who played the sousaphone in her school's band. So she's going to tell you a little bit about the sousaphone and play some scales so you can see how that works. Senior band student Valerie Carrillo, who was small in stature, picked up and trained to play the sousaphone, one of the largest of band instruments, in her sophomore year. Three years later, she continues to toot her own horn. I've been playing the sousaphone for about three years. I started playing it my sophomore year of high school, and then I've been playing it up until today, uh, senior year. As you 
can imagine, it takes a lot of practicing when you're learning how to play the tuba or really any musical instrument. All right, let's end today's lesson listening to The Stars and Stripes Forever, which was written by John Philip Sousa. In 1987, Congress named it the official National March of the United States of America. Here is the Laura High School Saxon Marching Band performing Sousa's favorite march at the 62nd Annual Arcadia Festival of Bands. Check out those sousaphones. again you caught me all right everyone thank you so much for watching see you next time mrs duraco signing out well oh wait i forgot there is an encore one more video so check that out that's another john philip sousa piece and for your homework i would like you to send me a picture or a video of you dancing to either the uh, piece that Sarah Willis plays in Havana, Cuba, or the Chartist piece with um, Oystein Brodsvik, or you may choose to be in a marching band and march around to the Stars and Stripes forever, or even this last piece, Semper Fidelis. Have a wonderful day. See you next time. Bye. Composers often receive inspiration for their greatest works from those closest to them. Such is the case with the music we are about to play, a march composed by John Philip Sousa in 1888 while he was leader of the Marine Band. In the words of the composer, I wrote this march one night while in tears after my comrades of the Marine Corps had sung their famous hymn in Quantico. The result is a march Sousa considered to be his finest. Dedicated to the officers and Marines of the United States Marine Corps, it has been adopted as the Corps' official march and borrows its title from our sacred motto, Semper Fidelis. <laughs>